you would like to share the screen? Hi everyone, so should I share my lecture now or? Uh, please show? wait, please. Yeah, please wait, please. Hello, Faye, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How have you been, see? Good, thank you. How's everything, Faye? Yes, yeah, not bad, yes. Do you have any difficulties in joining the Zoom link in today? No, it was all good. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Faisim uh, and Ms. Pinsi and Dr. Sabdono Hadi. We would like to introduce our staff member in Department of Pharmacy, Faculty of Med Science, 11 Maret University. Uh, we have four divisions. The first division is uh, pharma pharmaceutical biology with uh, Ms. Estu Rednaning Tias, Dr. Nestri Hendayani, Ms. Dinar, and uh, Ms. Rita as the head of division. The second is a division of pharmaceutic with Mr. Fea, Mr. Saiful Khoiri, and Dr. Rofik as the head of division. And the third is pharmaceutical chemistry with uh, Mr. Adi Yukatama and Dr. Saptono Hadi as the head of this division. Dr. Saptono Hadi is our head department also in Department of Pharmacy, Faculty of Med Science, uh, as well as Marat University. And the fourth is uh, pharmacology and clinical division with Ms. Uh, Yeni, Ms. Vinci, and me, Rasmaya, as the head of division. Okay. Uh, we are now opening the, this case lecture with Dr. Faisim. Dr. Tin Faisim is a senior lecturer and the coordinator of international engagement in the School of Pharmacy and Biological Sciences at Curtin University. Dr. Sim is also the president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, Western Australia branch. She is a registered pharm practicing pharmacy and she is also a pharmacy board of Australian appointed oral practice examiner. So it's an honor for us to have you here today. Thank you. Uh, we are going to have a lecture and discussion class with Dr. Sim with the topic pharmacy-led immunization service. Okay, Dr. Sim, time is yours for the Thank lecture you. and discussion. Thank you, Rasmaya. Yeah. Can I just share my um, presentation? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just check that you can all see the slides? Yes? Yes, I can see the slide. Thank you. Yes, yeah. So thank you, everyone, and thank you for the lovely introduction, and thank you for having me here today to speak with you all. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you all to talk to you about pharmacist-led immunization service um, and what we do here in Australia. 
So I usually like to start um, guest lectures with uh, a bit of declaration about my involvement. Um, so as um, introduced by your, uh, your department lead, I'm a senior lecturer and the coordinator of international engagement in the School of Pharmacy and Biomedical Sciences at Curtin University in Australia. Um, I'm the current president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, Western Australian branch, and I'm a practicing community pharmacist and the pharmacy owner in Western Australia uh, in Perth. So I um, know one of your lecturers really well, Vinci Miss Ranita. So Vinci is one of my uh, PhD um, students, and she's doing um, a really brilliant job, a really good job here. So yeah, so thank you, Vinci, for the, for linking me to your team, um, to your head of department, and to your students. Thank you. So what I'm hoping to cover today in the half an hour uh, uh, lecture is to give you an overview about pharmacist immunization service in Australia, and the processes involved in. Uh, in conducting a pharmacist-led immunization service, the relevant guidelines and the processes in which how we obtain consent from patient and how do we screen patients for suitability to get vaccination, how do we do hand hygiene and the consideration um, about infection control, including needle stick injury, and also around anaphylaxis training and management, and also cold chain management and how we store vaccines. And later on, after the half an hour lecture, I'll be very happy to stay around and answer any questions that you may have. So to give you some background information, um, my understanding is that in Indonesia, if you want to get a vaccination, you would need to go to a doctor or a nurse. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So in Australia, because... You're all going to be a pharmacist one day. You are studying pharmacy now. Um, if you were in Australia now, appropriately trained pharmacist can now administer vaccines, which means a patient in the community can walk into a pharmacy and ask for a vaccination. And the pharmacist would actually inject the vaccine for the person. So in Australia, people can get vaccinated from their doctors, so from their GPs, from nurses, and from pharmacists. So how did this all happen? So in Western Australia, we were only able to vaccinate people starting from 2014, so about six years ago. But prior to six years ago, immunization in um, the pharmacy has, is something that has been done in other parts of the world, including in the USA, in the UK, in Egypt, in Portugal, in New Zealand, in Saudi Arabia, in Canada, and in some parts of India. Pharmacists have been administering vaccines for a long time, but it became a new thing in Australia in 2014. Now, I know that in some parts of, in many parts of the world, especially in Southeast Asia, like Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Vietnam, Thailand, in all of these places, pharmacists still cannot administer vaccinations. And personally, I, I'm, I was born and raised in Malaysia. So I grew up in Malaysia and I came over to Western Australia to study pharmacy when I was 17 years old. So that was a long time ago. I wouldn't tell you how old I am, but <laughs> it was a good 16, 17 years ago. Um, so, and now I, I work in Western Australia. So, the, so I fully understand, I suppose, how it works in Malaysia because I grew up there. And I know that Malaysia is very similar to Indonesia in terms of access to healthcare and access to vaccinations. So um, it's very interesting because um, last year I was contacted by um, Singapore, um, some people from Singapore to say that they are looking at getting their pharmacist upskilled so pharmacists can give vaccinations and injections. So it does seem like the flavor is we're moving towards 
pharmacists giving vaccinations because pharmacists are very, very easily accessible. So that's my second point here which is to say that pharmacy access is seen as a major advantage. Because like in Indonesia, in Australia, you have a pharmacy everywhere. You get pharmacy, pharmacy is very easily accessible. So people in the community can easily go to a pharmacy and get vaccination. So the idea is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And um, so how it all happened was in Australia, we have the Pharmacy Board of Australia that registers and governs all the pharmacies registered in Australia. So in December 2013, the Pharmacy Board of Australia stated that vaccination was within the scope of practice of a pharmacist, provided appropriate training and standard practice were in place. So what that meant was straight after December 2013, in 2014, we started training pharmacists to give injections and vaccinations. And then in 2014, pharmacists provided vaccinations. So it has moved very quickly. And over the last five to six years, we have demonstrated that pharmacists can vaccinate, especially um, for influenza vaccines, and pharmacists can do that very safely. So this slide here is just to give you some background information about how it all started. So it started with a trial or a pilot study in Queensland. So this is another part of Australia in 2014 to train up some pharmacists to give vaccination. And you can see that um, the trial included only flu vaccinations. So it included flu vaccinations only. Um, and just in 2014, in only one year, yeah. in that trial, pharmacists provided vaccinations to 11,000 adults. And that was a lot. And more than 8,000 of these people actually conducted the survey. And 93% of them were very happy to receive vaccination from a pharmacy. So what is happening right now in 2020 in Western Australia is that any pharmacist that provides a vaccine in Western Australia, they must comply with all the requirements that are stated in the WA Health Department's Structured Administration and Supply Arrangement, which is like the law. So it's a legal document that states out, if you want to give a vaccine, what do you need to comply with? So it talks about registration qualification, it talks about competencies, it, it talks about the pharmacy requirements, what, you know, the size of the pharmacy, what policies and procedures you need to have. And also, um, right now in Western Australia, pharmacists are allowed to give influenza vaccine, so that's your flu vaccine, to anyone 10 years and above, and to give measles, mumps and rubella, which is MMR vaccine, to people 16 years and above, and also give diphtheria, tetanus, acellular pertussis, which is DTPA combination vaccination to people 16 years and above, and also meningococcal ACWI conjugate vaccination to people 16 years and above. So, so long as we meet these criteria and requirements, pharmacists in Australia are able to provide these sort of vaccinations within their scope. Um, and at the moment, pharmacists in Western Australia can give a vaccine within a pharmacy and also outside of a pharmacy. So a pharmacist can, for example, um, go to a school or go to a workplace, go to a department and actually vaccinate the staff um, in that area, provided that they follow appropriate protocol and procedure. But obviously, someone can also walk into a pharmacy and ask for the vaccine and the pharmacist will be able to inject the vaccine for them. So the next few slides, I just want to talk you through what happens before someone gets vaccinated, what happens during vaccination, and what happens after vaccination. So what happens before is that someone can come in so you can walk in, if you are in Western Australia at the moment, if you are in Perth now, say if Vinci is in Perth now, if Vinci wants to get a flu vaccine, Vinci would either call up a pharmacy and say, can I make an appointment to come in and get vaccinated? Or Vinci can simply just walk in 
to the pharmacy and ask to get vaccinated. So what happens after the patient has come into your pharmacy, you then advise them of how much it costs, what is involved, and also how long the whole procedure would take. And then the pharmacist would do a pre-screening whereby they would ask a lot of questions to make sure that the patient is suitable to get the vaccine in the pharmacy today. So this includes checking about ADR risk, which is adverse drug reaction risk, um, and also checking for eligibility to see if they would qualify to get any free vaccines if they were to go to, for example, a GP. If they are not suitable to get vaccinated in the pharmacy as a result of your screening, you then refer this person to a GP, to a doctor. But if the person is suitable to get the vaccine in your pharmacy today, you would collect their details, so their name, their date of birth, their age, their address, their contact details, their medical history, what medications are they on, and also give them the information, including the processes involved, where are you going to inject? So for a flu vaccine, we normally like to inject into the deltoid muscle, which is up on your shoulder, uh, just on your deltoid here, on your upper arm. And we do that intramuscularly, which means into the muscle. And what happens is you would tell someone that after we've given you the vaccination, you must stay in the pharmacy for 15 minutes because we need to monitor you for any side effects. And if the patient is very happy, the patient would then read and sign the consent form and then the patient will, will go into a consult room and then you will give the vaccine. So the next slide here is I want to talk about what happens during the process. So imagine in this case, you as the pharmacist, you are now seeing the patient in the private consult room within the pharmacy. The pharmacist then confirms that the patient fully understands what is involved and that consent has been given. And then the pharmacist will go ahead and wash their hands and clean and sterilize their hands following the hand hygiene procedure. And the pharmacist will then check the vaccine expiry date and whether the vaccine is stored appropriately and whether it is safe. And the pharmacist then administer or inject the vaccine. And then the used vaccine, the used injection, would be immediately disposed of um, into a yellow sharps container. And then, of course, the pharmacist will wash their hands again. Now, the next slide here is about what happens after. So what happens after an injection is that the pharmacist will need to give them an influenza vaccine after care card or something similar such that people know how to manage side effects if that happens. Um, and also the patient needs to stay in the pharmacy for 15 minutes. And during this time, the patient would the pharmacist would monitor the patient for any signs of adverse drug reaction. Um, if there is no adverse drug reaction, patient feels fine, they're happy, they will leave the pharmacy. If there was some expected or minor or common adverse drug reaction, such as you know, injection site reaction, because after injections, people might get some pain, they might have some swelling or redness on the area, then the pharmacist will provide um, ailment support. So that would include, for example, asking them to take paracetamol or Panadol to help with the pain or asking them to use ice packs because ice will reduce the swelling and the redness on their skin um, uh, as a result of local injection site reaction. And the pharmacist would then document this onto their profile. But if they have any severe or anaphylactic reaction, and I'll talk about anaphylactic reaction later on so you fully understand what that means. But if they get any severe, very serious anaphylactic reaction, they would need to commence in an emergency anaphylaxis management, which means using adrenaline injection and then call an ambulance and record this in the patient's profile. The pharmacist would also need to complete all the documentation and then send the notification letter to a GP to tell the GP that the patient has been given this vaccine. 
then the record needs to be kept for seven years, including any of the signed consent forms and the vaccine information and any GP notification letters. So that is the last step in giving one vaccine. So you can see how there are so many steps. And if I go back to the previous slide, you see how actually the last, the second last one, pharmacists, um, immunizer pharmacists administering the vaccination, the injection part is only one of the 20, 30 steps in vaccination. So people might think, oh, injection vaccination means sticking a needle into someone's arm, poking someone's arm, but that is only one small part of the whole process. There's a lot that a pharmacist would need to consider when it comes to vaccination. So um, this is the guideline that I, I would like to share with you all. So this is what we use in Australia. Um, so the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia um, is the custodian for this particular guideline. So they own this guideline. Um, so this is practice guidelines for pharmacists providing immunization services. So the guideline is really good because it, it outlines all the steps, procedures, and policies and everything to guide a pharmacist to provide the service. So um, this guideline will get updated every few years when we need, um, when we have new vaccines or new procedures and new considerations. Um, and in this particular version, which is May 2020, I was one of the um, contributor or um, validator for the guideline. So. Um, and I can tell you that this is the guideline that we recommend all pharmacists in Australia to follow when they are providing vaccination. So I would imagine if other countries such as Singapore or even Indonesia, if you are looking at um, expanding your scope of practice to give vaccinations, you would also need to develop a practice guidelines to guide your pharmacist. And if that's the, the case down the track, I'll be very happy to assist you as well, if that's um, useful. So I'd like to talk about patient consent now because you can't just force a needle or an injection into anyone because the person actually needs to say yes. They need to say, yes, I agree and I give consent to be vaccinated. So patient consenting is something that is very, very important. But there are a few elements of a valid consent. So first of all, the consent must be provided voluntarily. That means that people are not forced to give consent. They must be voluntary. And the second point is they must be provided by a person with adequate legal and intellectual capacity. So if that person is not able to provide consent because of their age, because of a medical condition or intellectual uh, or legal capacity, then the person needs to actually obtain a carer and the carer needs to be involved in providing the consent. Um, but also consenting means that people must be given with all the detailed information available about the procedure, the benefits of the procedure and any potential or actual risk involved with the options of alternative if required. So you can't just ask someone yes or no, unless you tell them what is involved. So to, so the element of a valid consent, which we emphasize a lot, is to make sure that people understand what is going to happen. So imagine you yourself as a final year pharmacy student. You guys are in final year, isn't it? Yeah. So imagine you're in your final year of study and someone tells you, okay, I'm going to inject you. I'm going to give you a vaccine. Of course, you're going to ask them, no, no, before you do that, tell me what is involved. Tell me what am I going to expect? Tell me what is happening. So you then need to give consent um, to the person that is going to give you that procedure. So always put yourself in the patient's shoe when you provide clinical services because you need to understand what the patient needs and then you can actually give them what they need. So obviously, um, in terms of consent, the details of the vaccine, including the name of the vaccine, the date, the expiry date of the vaccine, and how have you given it? Is it intramuscular? Is it subcutaneous? Um, so what angle did you use when you inject? What part of the muscle in the body did you use? 
all of these things will need to be documented and recorded and documented on the system. Um, and the entire pro procedure must also be documented. So how do you determine if someone can be vaccinated? So not everybody can get a vaccine because vaccine is not safe for everybody. Vaccine is only safe for certain type of people. So when it comes to clinical knowledge, this is when a pharmacist will come in with their clinical knowledge to screen someone. So screening meaning you ask them a lot of questions to see if they will be suitable to get vaccinated. So in Australia, what we do is we follow the HALO or H-A-L-O um, procedure. So H stands for health, A stands for, uh, stands for H, L stands for lifestyle, and O stands for occupation. So what that means is you would ask them a lot of questions about their health background, about how old they are and any age consideration, their lifestyle factors, and their occupation, and more specifically, ask them about their medical history. Do you have any medical conditions? Do you take any medications at the moment? Because sometimes there will be some interactions between a vaccine and their current medication. You also very importantly need to ask them about allergies. Are you allergic to any medicine and vaccine? If they are allergic to any vaccine or vaccine component, they cannot get the vaccine today from you, at least. You will need to refer them to a GP. We also ask them, have you had this vaccine before in the past? If you have had the vaccine in the past, did you get any reaction from the vaccine? If you have any reaction to the vaccine, then you need to document that and you need to consider if it is safe to that they have the vaccine again this time. So the, the purpose of today's lecture is not so that, you know, you get fully trained in this. This is just to give you some idea about what we go through before we give someone a vaccine. So the key take home message on this slide here is to remember that it is very important to assess patients very thoroughly. And that's what we meant by screening to ensure that the vaccine is suitable. If the vaccine is not suitable for this patient, they should not be given the vaccine today. Okay, so the next slide I wanna talk about is in relation to hand hygiene. So this is actually um, available from the World Health Organization. So the World Health Organization recommends a particular way of how we wash our hands. Okay, so um, very interestingly, can I ask the question, how long, you know, before you eat something, you go and wash your hands. How long do you think normally it takes for you to wash your hands? Five seconds? Ten seconds? Or shorter? Two seconds? <laughs> I can see some smiles and some nodding. So, you know, imagine if we go, oh, before I eat, oh, my hands are dirty. I'm going to go and wash my hands. Literally, people turn the tap on and they wash their hands and they finish washing their hands in five seconds which is not good because studies have shown to properly wash your hands, each hand washing session must be at least 40 to 60 seconds. So a homework for you all before I see you all next week again, the next time I want you to do is when you wash your hands, I want you to count one to 60 and you have to count until 60. That should be the entire time of how long you wash your hands. So if you look at on the right-hand side here, on this slide, how to hand wash on the right-hand side, you see it says the entire duration must be 40 to 60 seconds. And there are a few steps. So when you wash, you don't just wash like that. You must wash in between your fingers and you must wash top and bottom. And then you must clean the fingers clean your thumbs, clean the fingernails, and then wash and rinse with water. On the left-hand side here, you see how to hand rub. So hand to, how to hand rub means you're not using water. You're, you're just using one of those alcohol um, hand rub. I mean, because of COVID-19, I'm sure you all know about using hand rub, alcohol hand rub. Um, if it's still available, because in Australia it went out of stock initially, but it is now back in stock. 
Um, but if you use alcohol hand rub, it should also be at least 20 to 30 seconds. So after the lecture today, I'll be very happy to um, share my slides. So maybe I can email Vinci uh, my slides and Vinci can um, help to share that with you all. And you can have this slide with you and I want you to all experience this. So next time when you wash your hands, count and, and follow the steps because that's the way how we all should properly wash our hands because Trust me, before COVID-19, nobody knows how to wash our hands because even when I wash my hands, I just wash with five seconds, but actually it needs to be 60 seconds. So it's a very interesting fact. Do you wash your hands longer when you want to vaccinate someone? Longer <laughs> than 60 seconds? No, so, so vaccination 60 seconds is, is enough. But um, very interesting you asked this, Vinci, because you're saying if we are vaccinating, do we need to wash longer compared to if we're just eating? But in the COVID world that we live in, hand washing is very important. So everybody should wash for 60 seconds, regardless if you're vaccinating someone or not. Mm -hmm. Vaccinating for 60 seconds is what we need to do. Yeah. Um, the next couple of uh, images, uh, photos here, I just took from our pharmacy um, department's consultation room. Um, so, Vinci, I, I can show you this room when you are interested next time um, when you're on campus. So, mm -hmm. this is this is what we do when we train our pharmacy students. So we train our pharmacy students in vaccination now in their final year degree so that when they graduate, they can vaccinate people when they're doing their internship. So this, this is a couple of photos that I took from our, our model pharmacy on campus um, because obviously you need to have adequate hand washing facility in the clinic. You also need to have hand rub um, you also need to have instructions on how to hand rub. Um, so this is how we set up a vaccination clinic. And we call this a pharmacist lab vaccination clinic, not a doctor or a nurse's lab. So pharmacist lab, meaning the pharmacist is in charge and the pharmacist is the one that actually injects and give the vaccine. Um, also, I like to talk about infection control and needle stick injury. So, um, we should, the, any vaccination clinic must have an infection control protocol because a vaccine comes as an injection and the injection is a very sharp needle and there they, they could be a risk of needle stick injury, which means you've accidentally injured yourself or you have accidentally injured yourself, you've pricked yourself with a used needle. If you've injected and used the needle on someone else, on one of your patients, and then you accidentally, you know, touch the needle and inject yourself as well, there could be a risk of um, transmitting diseases. If that person has hepatitis B, hepatitis C, if they have HIV, you know, there could be a risk of transmitting um, blood-borne diseases. So therefore, infection control and needle stick protocol must be in place. So every pharmacy now, if in Australia, if they give vaccinations, they must have this infection control. And I've put a couple of photos here. These are the yellow sharps containers. I'm not sure if that is what you use in Indonesia, but any sharps that has been used, it cannot go in a normal bin because someone else might get might be injured. So they must all go into a sharps container like this. Um, and also adverse drug reaction. So um, we teach all our students about um, common adverse drug reactions and severe adverse drug reactions following vaccination. So very commonly, we would expect some local injection site reaction. So if you inject onto the deltoid muscle up in the, on the upper arm, sometimes in the area, it might be a bit red it might be swollen, it might be painful to touch, and all of those are common and expected, and people can take paracetamol uh, and use ice packs. But people need to be taught how to manage this. So we also teach our students how to manage these things. Um, but also some people can get what we call the vasovagal reaction or fainting episodes. So what this is, is you might have someone who is very afraid and very scared of needles and blood. So when they get vaccinated, they are so scared and then they can faint. And that is actually a vasovagal reaction. So 
I'm sure you've all done pharmacology, so you know what vasovagal reaction is, but it basically means that um, when you are very scared, when you're very nervous about something, you go into a fight and flight mode, which is what we call a sympathetic tone, whereby you, you, all your blood will be pulled down to your heart because it needs to preserve your heart function. So, and, and the act of doing that is pulling blood away from your brain. So your brain lacks blood and oxygen. So your brain doesn't have enough blood and oxygen, and then you can feel fainting or dizzy. So, um, Vinci, what do you call sympathetic tone in, in, the, in, in the Indonesian language? So imagine when you've been chased by a tiger. If there was a tiger or a dog, you've been chased by a dog and you need to run really fast. What do you call that in Indonesia? We call it sim symptomatic. It's the same, symptomatic sim and asymptomatic. Yeah, symptomatic. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So, so imagine when you chased by a tiger, you're so scared, you need to run really fast. And in order for you to run really fast, all the blood needs to go to your heart because your heart needs to pump faster to bring more oxygen to your blood and to your muscles so you can run faster, you've got more energy. But imagine when someone is afraid of needles, there's no tiger, there's no dog, or no one is chasing them. But the fear that they have is the same as the fear as though they're in danger. So imagine when that happens, suddenly the brain would lack oxygen and, and blood and that can cause fainting sometimes. So that's what I meant by vasovagal reaction or fainting. But the last dot point here, which is very important to remember, is rare but life-threatening side effects from vaccinations. Is It is very rare, very, very rare, but when it does happen, it can kill the person. So this is anaphylaxis or anaphylactic reaction. So if someone has anaphylactic reaction, they can die from anaphylactic reaction if you don't manage the condition immediately. So to manage anaphylactic reaction, the only thing that is going to work is adrenaline injections. So anaphylaxis, if it was anaphylaxis, adrenaline must be used immediately to save lives. So in Australia, we can get an adrenaline as an auto-injector, just over the counter. We don't need a prescription from the doctor. I, I'm assuming you would also have something similar in Indonesia. No, it is the same thing that people use if someone is allergic to peanuts or they're allergic to bees or bee stings, for example. They would use something like that if they experience anaphylactic reaction. Um, now, anaphylaxis is considered when there is any acute onset illness with typical skin features such as a rash plus involvement of respiratory, so breathing, and cardiovascular and or persistent severe gastrointestinal symptoms or any acute onset of hypotension or bronchospasm or upper airway obstruction where anaphylaxis is considered possible even if typical skin features are not present. So long story short, Anaphylaxis is like when someone feels they have an allergic reaction and that can cause them to not be able to breathe. They will go, oh, I can't breathe. And that's because of all the swelling and all the allergic reaction that comes from the, the, the allergy. So that is why in Australia, you can see on the right hand side here, I've put an image here from our Australian Government Department of Health Australian Immunization Handbook. And the handbook says that every immunization clinic, if you set up a clinic, you must have an anaphylaxis response kit. So the anaphylaxis response kit should have adrenaline ampules, it should have needles and syringes, it should have cotton wool swabs, pen and paper, the doses of intramuscular adrenaline, and also a laminated copy of recognition and treatment of anaphylaxis document. So this is a kit, for, uh, this is the anaphylaxis response kit for just in case if someone is allergic to something and then they can use and follow the kit. So this is an example of how we set up our clinic. You can see we've put up posters on how to actually um, manage anaphylaxis. And you can see on top of the shelf there, there is a, an anaphylaxis response kit, which is like a first aid kit, but it's not the normal first aid kit. 
because it needs to have adrenalines and needles and sharps and, and, and injections. I also want to talk about cold chain and storage of vaccines. So most vaccines must be stored in the fridge between two to eight degrees Celsius. If they're not kept within this temperature, the efficacy and the stability of the vaccine may be affected. And I know you all learn pharmaceutics, so you learn about storage of um, medicine is very important. So cold chain means from start to finish, from when, when the vaccine is being manufactured to when it is administered to a patient. The whole time, the vaccine must be stored between two to eight degrees Celsius. And there must be a system in place to monitor for cold chain and cold chain breach. Um, and also, you know, there must be a monitoring in place for the vaccine fridge. So in Australia, every pharmacy must have a vaccine fridge and the fridge is just for medicine and vaccine. Um, staff and pharmacists cannot put their lunch in there. It must be a medicine and vaccine fridge. And the temperature of that fridge must be monitored at least twice a day. So normally, it is the job of the student or the intern pharmacist or the junior pharmacist. Every day when they go in, they must monitor the temperature twice and document that. Okay, so um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, this is just to give you an overview of the considerations around vaccination. I haven't gone into detail, but I'll be very happy to answer any questions um, you may have. And if any one of you are interested, you know, some of you down the track, you might be interested, like your lecturer, like Vinci, to come over here and do your PhD. You might do a PhD in vaccination or, or services. Um, if, if that was the case, I'll be very happy to help you. But yeah, are, are, there, are there any questions for me? Um, stu student boleh langsung tanya, Bu, Bu Maya. Boleh. Uh, silakan adik-adik untuk bertanya. Okay, student, you can ask the question directly to Dr. Faisim. Maya mau tanya, itu kan enggak bisa kalau pakai bahasa Indonesia, bahasa Inggris. Kalau pakai bahasa Indonesia gimana? Oh ya, yeah, enggak apa-apa. Okay, student, uh, some student will ask in Indonesian and we will translate it into English. Yep. Okay. Ya, yeah, silakan adik-adik. So we don't have any adrenaline auto injector in Indonesia at the moment. Oh. So, yeah, uh, as far as I know, um, every time when um, someone gets uh, allergic, severe allergic, like anaphylaxis, um, we normally go to the hospital straight away. Okay. The emergency. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's one of the things that maybe... Um, Pharmacies here in Indonesia might need to increase that competence through, um, you know, mm. expanding their services, mm. such as like uh, those immunizations and um, um, giving like auto injector shot in um, Indonesia for those anaphylactic reaction and those type of things. So that's that's one of the things that's is the lovely presentation from you, Faye. So those students will get to know that um, pharmacies here in Australia can actually vaccinate it patients while um, in Indonesia, we still don't have that service, that clinical practice thing yet at the moment, but maybe they, uh, maybe because of your lecture, then we can start it to consider, to increase, to expand the competence, pharmacy's competence here in yeah. Indonesia, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. It is also my understanding that um, a lot of Southeast Asia countries are now looking at getting pharmacies to give vaccines because doctors and nurses, they are busy and they're busy doing other things. Pharmacists are busy too, but you know, doctors and nurses, they can deal with other more chronic conditions like you know, their hypertension, their diabetes, their heart failure, cancer and you know all those other more chronic complex conditions so things like vaccination can be done by a pharmacist and it has been proven to be safe and effective when done in the pharmacy environment mm -hmm. okay thank you dr facing we have two students will ask the question yep anita and claudia please all right thank you so much 
Nisma ya. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. My yes. name is Anindita. Yes. Uh, first thing I want to confirm about uh, are not all registered pharmacies in Australia able to provide uh, the vaccine you have told us about, or uh, for registered uh, for this registered pharmacies, uh, there are need uh, some uh, license or training program before they could uh, administer uh, the vaccine. And yeah. secondly, secondly, uh, I want to know to support the successful pharmacist-led flu vaccination program. Are there specific uh, targets or factor we need to prioritize? Maybe uh, more to elderly or uh, to baby or uh, any other factor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You are Anita, isn't it? Very good questions asked. Very good. Um, they're all really good questions. So the first um, question you had was in relation to registration and qualification and can all pharmacies give the vaccine? So at the moment, not all pharmacies can give because a lot of the pharmacies who have graduated earlier, like 10, 20 years ago, they would not have done this they would not have learned injection skills when they were at university. So therefore, um, if, they if they register to be a pharmacist um, more than you know, five, six years ago, they all need to do a vaccination training program. And the vaccination training program is about 12 hours of online learning and uh, one day, eight hours of face-to-face -face workshop and then assessment. And they have to demonstrate in the assessment how they inject um, into each other. And, and so to answer your question, they need to do special training on top of that. But for the new graduates, so current students um, in some universities, such as Curtin University, where I'm from, we are already training the students in their final year. So if they are already trained in their final year, then they will get that qualification if they pass the assessment. Um, so it really depends on when they have graduated uh, and whether they've undergone the training or not. Yeah. And Anita, the other question you had was um, whether we need to target um, and prioritize any particular population? That is a really good question. So um, there are indeed exactly like you say, high risk populations. So the elderly, very young babies, people with chronic health conditions, these people are at high risk of um, complications if they do get the flu for example. So these people should be prioritized and targeted and encouraged, highly encouraged to get vaccinated. So in Australia, we do have a policy or in Western Australia, we do have a policy to specifically target people at high risk population. But we also want to encourage everyone, even if they're not at high risk to get vaccinated, because some people, if you remember what I said earlier, some people might not qualify to get the vaccine. They, it might not be safe for them because their immune system might be so weak that they can't receive a vaccine. Now, if but to protect these people, we need to have what we call the herd immunity. So herd immunity means if we can achieve the majority of the people in the community get vaccinated, then more people would get protected because if more people get vaccinated, it will actually protect those people who did not get vaccinated because if we can reduce any um, disease in the area, we can reduce the chances of people getting the, the, the disease. Yeah, but very good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we will have questions from Claudia. Yeah. Ya, Claudia. Oh, Bu, ini saya tanyanya bahasa Indonesia nih. <laughs> jadi begini, yeah. jadi begini yeah. Bu, untuk uh, pada pemberian vaksin tuh biasanya tuh saya tuh melihat kejadian secara langsung di gudang farmasi kesehatan Pacitan. Jadi ketika pendistribusian dari misalnya dari puskesmas ke gudang farmasi itu membutuhkan jarak yang sangat jauh dan terkadang itu yang mendistribusikan juga mampir-mampir seperti itu Bu. Nah, apakah itu juga akan 
uh, sedikit kenaikan dari temperatur yang ada pada suhu cengnya, chambernya itu tuh akan mempengaruhi misalnya dari tadi kan 2 sampai 8 derajat celcius untuk suhu chambernya nah ketika kita membawanya itu tadi dan mampir-mampir atau seperti itu apakah akan berpengaruh kepada vaksinnya dan sebaiknya itu seperti apa gitu loh apa nah, apakah harus kita selaku farmasis itu memonitoring terus terkait dengan uh, ketika dia sampai dan ketika dia didistribusikan sampai ke puskesmas itu bu begitu Okay. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Claudia asked about the transportation of the vaccination. Yeah, mm -hmm. is there any recommendations or uh, procedure to deliver the immunizations from the distributor, maybe uh, to uh, the clinic? Because in Indonesia we have like a uh, Department of Health. Yeah, Department of Health. Uh, we have the storage, mm -hmm. the main storage in Department of Health in. Uh, in every city and from the uh, storage unit we deliver to puskesmas to the clinic so is there any uh, procedure to transport the uh, the vaccine to maintain in a good condition yeah thank you thank you thank you Rosmaya, and thank you claudia very good question claudia so that goes back to the cold chain problem which is a big problem um and in australia what we do is um there is actually um, a lot of guidelines and procedure about how to maintain the storage and how they're transported from manufacturer to the pharmacy so all the vaccines needs to be kept when doing transportation in an ASCII box and the ASCII box will have an ice pack on the bottom and different layers of protection. And then they're all sealed so that the temperature will, be, will stay between two to eight degrees Celsius. But also within those boxes, we have temperature monitoring chips. Uh, I don't know if you have that in Australia, but it's a temperature monitoring whereby if the temperature of that box has exceeded a particular temperature, the color will change from blue to from red to blue. And when it changes, it changes forever. It does it cannot go back. It's not reversible. So even if someone then takes that vaccine and put it back in the fridge, the, the color doesn't change. So if you are the if say I'm the pharmacist, I've received this vaccine from the from the manufacturer, from the wholesaler. And when I look at the box, the color indicator, the temperature monitoring and the color indicator has changed. I know that it hasn't been stored appropriately. So I will reject that batch and they need to send me a new batch. So that is what we do here in to monitor the temperature during transportation. So there are definitely a lot of policies and procedures in place um, to ensure cold chain from start to finish. But very good question, Claudia. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask about the lifestyle. You mentioned about the lifestyle uh, mm -hmm. that can be contraindicated for the patients to get immunizations. Yeah. Or what kind of lifestyle? Okay, so um, thank you. So the lifestyle question is a good question as well. So um, when we say lifestyle is you want to find out about what the person normally do every day. And say, for example, if they have retired and they travel to different countries for holiday, they, they travel to different places and different places may have different diseases and there might be some travel injections travel vaccines that they need to have. So for example, some areas might have yellow fever. So then if they're going to the area of cholera or malaria and all these you know, different diseases in a particular area. So if, for example, their lifestyle is that they travel to different places, then you need to ask them, are you using any other vaccine? Have you been given any other vaccine? Do you need to take any other vaccines? And if they have been given another vaccine, there is a lot of um, consideration because some vaccines can be given together. Some you can't give it at the same time. Some you have to wait for four weeks, depending if it was a live virus vaccine or a, or a weakened in, uh, attenuated vaccine. So, 
So it depends what they've had previously. And also lifestyle, it's like if they work um, uh, because of their work, they need to use their left arm a lot. So then you need to ask that question because then you, you don't inject into their left arm. You should inject into their right arm. So, so the lifestyle is to try and understand the person, the patient's other lifestyle factors so that you can give them the best service. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have two more questions from Anita and Sevina. Yeah. Okay, please, Anita. Okay, thank you. Let me introduce myself. My name is Anita. Uh, as you told that before someone will be able to get the vaccination, a pharmacist would do medical screening about his or her condition. Uh, yeah. My question is what the criteria if someone uh, in a good condition or someone is suitable to get the vaccine? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Anita. Good question. So um, we actually have, so when we properly train our students, there is a whole checklist. There is a screening checklist with all the details in there. So to answer your question, if someone has, for example, a previous anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine, then they can't have the vaccine. If they are, um, if they have, if they don't have a functioning spleen, then you know their immune system might be weakened, so they can't have the vaccine. If they are immunocompromised, if they have cancer and they're using chemotherapy, they're using cancer treatments which may suppress their immune system. If they're immunosuppressed in any way, then they can't have the vac they may not be able to have the vaccine or they need to have different doses of vaccine. So in general, we always say everyone can have the vaccine unless if they are this, 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 and this. So the checklist that we have that we teach students to use has all of those things on the checklist and the pharmacist will sit down with the patient and go through it with the patient and ask them all, all those questions to see if they're suitable to get vaccinated or not. The other thing as well is if someone is a, uh, has had a previous condition known as Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a syndrome that can happen when someone gets the flu vaccine. Very rare, but it can happen. There's a, a, a small chance that it might happen. And when that happens, um, there is an increased risk of the person experiencing Guillain-Barre syndrome again in the future. So that is something to take into consideration. So to answer your question, you know, it, um, when we do the training with the students, they spend about five hours doing the um, so, you know, the online learning it is about 12 hours, but out of the 12 hours, about five hours is about this, is about under what situation can you give? Under what situation can you not give? So, yeah, so that, so they, the students would normally learn all about that. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from Sefina. Oh, and oh, Arta, saya... yeah, after that. Yeah. Saya pakai bahasa Indonesia. Tadi dokter kan mengatakan kalau kita harus men-screening pasien berdasarkan umur juga. Nah, dikabarkan kalau, uh, kalau vaksin COVID-19 ini akan dikasihkan ke semua orang, itu apakah ada batasan-batasan tertentu mengenai umur pasien tersebut atau bagaimana bagaimana pendapat dokternya? Terima kasih. Oke, okay. uh, Dr. Faisim, Sevina asked about uh, COVID immunization. Yep. Is there any COVID immunization right now in Australia? Yeah. Good question, Serena. Um, no. <laughs> so, so not available right now. So COVID vaccine is definitely something that is um, a big topic now. Everyone in the whole wide world is asking that and waiting for a COVID vaccine. Uh, and I'm sure you guys are the same in Indonesia. So there are a few available, uh, no, sorry, there are a few vaccines currently being trialed. So um, for example, there is the Oxford uh, COVID-19 vaccine. There is also the, um, uh, the, uh, the, there is an Australian um, UQ uh, vaccine that's currently being trialed, but none of those vaccines are available or approved yet for the general public. 
so so not right now unfortunately but i think the whole wide world is hoping for that to come very soon <laughs> so people can be protected yeah 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 we are looking forward to have it right <laughs> yes yeah. yeah yeah we have a next question from arta uh, where is arta ada bu yeah um I heard before that Dr. Faisim mentioned about the injection lecture, right? Uh, yeah. And my question is, uh, how does the injection lecture practice in Australia itself? Because um, do all the students given uh, a practice to learn the injection to person to person or how? Because in Indonesia itself, especially in my uh, third grade or third year, I only learned Uh, how to give an in injection to the mice <laughs> yeah yeah good question arthur so what we do is um the students would do 12 hours online learning before coming to face to face workshop and during the online learning we teach them they learn about the angle um what needle size Um, the gauge size, the length of the needle, the angle is 90 degrees, is it 45 degrees? They learn all about that before coming to workshop. When they come into workshop, they work in pairs. So they work with a friend together and we give them a, a, what we call an intramuscular injection training pad. So it's a, it's a device that looks like a deltoid muscle, but it's a fake muscle. It's not real. Uh, and the students would then practice on the intramuscular injection training pads um, as many times as they like. And then just bef and then during the assessment, when we assess them for their skills, they have to inject um, normal saline into each other's arm. But that is only in the assessment and that is only if they want to do the assessment. But the training part, Um, is using the intramuscular injection training pad. Yeah. So, it's, so it's not using the real people for us? No, no, no. So we don't let them touch real people until they show us that they can do it properly. Yeah. yeah. So everyone oh, is really safe. <laughs> it's very interesting uh, but uh, before we conduct the service we should uh, establish the regulation at first yes uh, about the pharmacy services yeah that's we that's we don't have right now in indonesia maybe in the future with miss fancy after she returned to indonesia yes. <laughs> we'll expand the services yeah yeah uh, is there any is there any question another question Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is uh, is enough for this from the student? Yep. You can continue the lectures. As. Uh, is there any questions? Ada pertanyaan lagi, Bu Maya, dari student? Uh, dari anak-anak rasanya enggak. Uh, tadi disampaikan rasanya mau melanjutkan kuliah lebih lanjut kan, Tanya? Jadi yeah. dilanjutkan kuliahnya lagi. Kuliah dari Dr. Faisim. Ada kuliah lagi? Is there any uh, another lectures, Dr. Faisim? You can continue the lectures. I think it's that earlier. It's enough. Uh, I think it's for next week, uh, Bu Maya. Oh, for next week. Uh, oh. The medical review, uh, pharmacist medical reviews. I think it's next week yeah. on the 26th. Is is that what what I confirm with you, right, Ray? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I have in my diary next Thursday the same time, 11 o'clock next Thursday. So yeah. I will talk about medication reviews and clinical intervention, which is an, a clinical service that we do here, which Vinci is very familiar with. Um, so that is about how pharmacists go through with patients about their medicines, uh, when they should take these, when they should not take these, whether it interacts um, and the types of clinical problems. So I'll talk about that next week. Mm -hmm. okay. So maybe the last the last time, Faye, would you like to... Um, a little bit uh, introduce or introduce how the pharmacy students in Australia in their final year maybe um, are doing their um, and doing their final year for their uh, pharmacy services and um, one of those things or vaccination um, by giving such as like doing practicing using fake 
muscle and some of those type of things. So how do those um, final year, how do pharmacy students in Australia can, can get their registration, can get their registered pharmacies? Because normally in Indonesia, um, those final year pharmacy and final year students, they need to go to the apothecary degree yeah. for a one year apothecary degree yeah. and they need to do an internship for six months yeah. and they will go to the community pharmacy to community health centers to hospitals and pharmacy industry and those type of things that they are um, uh, intended to learn to so how how is actually here pharmacy students in australia uh, goes to become a registered pharmacist here do they have to do an internship as well in the hospital or in the pharmacy industry or in the community pharmacy or those type of things so uh, so maybe you might want to a little bit tell those students in final year so they can yep. have a little bit of view of how pharmacy students overseas especially in Australia done their uh, pharmacy degree yeah I'll be very happy to do that next time. Yep, yeah, at the next lecture. Yeah, yeah maybe. an idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. So, is there any more questions from the students about vaccination, maybe Bumaya, or maybe the lecturer, Bumaya itself? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is very uh, good opportunity for the student about uh, so the student will expand uh, their view about the pharmacy services in other country. It's very uh, honor for us to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Sim, for sharing your expertise in this class. And the pharmacy vaccination is an opportunity innovation in community pharmacy health services uh, delivery. So it's a uh, it's kind of an idea for us to expand uh, our services in this country. So before we end the class, we will have a photo sessions. So we welcome to all the attendees to take a position, have the video on please. And Mr. Adi and, and Mr. Saiful will help us in this photo session because we should give the report <laughs> about this event. Yeah, yeah. Is it good, Mr. Saipu? So wait for a moment. Uh, firstly, in the first layer, I think you can look your webcam. One, three, two, one, go. And then the second layer. Second layer, please. Three, two, one, go. We have uh, four layers and then uh, the third layer. And the and the end is the final layer. I think every everyone can show up your face and show on your video first. Okay, it is finished, Mr. Maya. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Saiful. Okay, uh, we are very honored to have Dr. Faisim with us here this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Sabtono Hadi as our head department, distinguished guests, lecturers, and students. We hope you have been enjoying yourself at this guest lecture today. Now we will close this event and we will meet again next week with Dr. Faisim. Thank you, Dr. Faisim. Thank you so much. Having me. See you Thank you week. very much, Faye. Yeah, Thank you. you next have week. a good day. Thank you, Dr. Faisim. See, see you next week. Thank see you, you. you next week. Thank see you. Week. Bye. Yeah, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Pamit ye, yeah. pamit Pak Saiful, Pak Sabtono, adik-adik, pamit.